Uh, welcome to the Curva Coaching Podcast. Uh, I'm Mike Smith and co-hosting today is Alf Galustian, uh, co-founder of Curva Coaching and delighted to have with us as a guest today, Roy Hodgson, a uh, man with an amazing 40-year career in the professional game. Uh, Roy, 22 teams, eight countries, uh, coaching the national teams, Switzerland, England, and, uh, and then at 71, with Crystal Palace, you became the oldest coach ever in the in the Premier League. So, an amazing history, and we're we're looking forward to delving into that. Um, but we're going to start off with sort of more the the here and now, and we'll just talk a little bit about Premier League, and uh, you know where we are with the Premier League. So close title race, you know, with uh, Guardiola, Man City, at at Arsenal. Maybe Ten Hag at Manchester United. So who's your money on? Well, I don't gamble, so uh, I don't have any problem <laughs> putting money anywhere. But uh, it's nice to see that the title race this year is going to be a much closer one than it's been perhaps in the last few years in terms of the number of teams that could possibly be involved. And certainly the fight for Champions League places yeah. has been more than complicated by the rise of Newcastle in particular, Tottenham also doing well and you wouldn't even write off the teams just a little bit below them because they're not so far behind. So it's made it a very interesting Premier League this year, both at top and bottom, because at the bottom, as many as eight teams could consider themselves in some danger of being relegated. I was reading with you know about the coaches, uh, the, the difference between Guardiola and Arteta and, and, and Ten Hag, and what difference that makes with a team. And you've been with you know many mm. teams... So if, if you switch it around, if you put Arteta in Manchester City and, and, and Guardiola in, in Arsenal, would it make a difference? No one knows, really. It's, mm. uh, you know, their personality, of course, does, does affect uh, the way a club operates and the way players within the club operate. And, and, of course, their theories and thoughts, I suppose, and their principles of play. But quite frankly, the most important factor is always the quality of players that yeah. each of those teams possess and I think it's a, a tough call at the moment really to say that one team is clearly in advance of the other in terms of the quality of their players. Size of benches plays a part and of course that's why we see teams these days spending an awful lot of money to put players on the bench. It never ceases to interest me to look at the substitutes bench mm. for the top teams. and As important as the coach, as know, important as who's the I big worked, name. I've worked at Blackburn, Fulham and, and Crystal Palace and at each of those clubs uh, when I've left there's been a, a surplus in actual fact in terms of money spent on transfers and yeah, yeah. money brought in whereas I'm looking at benches where there's literally a quarter of a million yeah, pounds yeah, yeah. Uh, you know 250 a quarter of a billion I should say 250 million pounds just on the bench with players that the club has decided are the right ones to bring in to make us better and yet they don't play because the players who've been playing are still in the team. But in terms of your question about coaches, my theory and my thought has always been that you need a good coach and a good manager for a team with good players. Mm. But a good manager with bad players won't win you anything, but a bad manager with good players can win you something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned the the other end of the league, you know, the the, the fight for to, to stay up in, in Premier League is a big, big, big deal. Staying Absolutely. up. Absolutely. And uh, Southampton, right? So Southampton, now they get rid of their coach again. So they're looking for a new coach. That's going to be the third coach in, in mm. half a season, right? So what's all that about? And, and is that good for the game? Now, this turnover of coaches, you know, um, 11 games in the season, five teams have got rid of their coaches. What, what, what's behind that? And is that good for the game? Well, we all know what's behind it and whether things are good for the game or not is a, a very difficult one to argue because it's about money. But the thing is that football clubs tend to be led by uh, the nose to some extent by their fans and by the mass media. Mm. So basically speaking, if it wasn't all about money and fans being encouraged to suggest that unless we're spending lots of money every year and buying lots and lots of players, we're not very good, then you wouldn't have the enormous success that Sky Sports has during mm. the months of January and during the summer transfer window when you know the goodness knows how many 
viewers tune in on the last day of the transfer yeah, yeah, yeah. to see who's moving and who's not moving. Um, basically speaking, you could argue that if you were leading a club, you might rail against that to some extent because you might be saying, I don't want to be pressurised into spending lots of money, which I'm not certain mm. is going to do our club any good in the future. I'd rather keep that money back than spend it on other things. But, of course, that's not what the fan-led yes, uh, mass yeah, media yeah. Are, are pushing you to do. And in terms of why there's lots of changes, and I think uh, almost half, if not over half, of the Premier League clubs this year have changed managers since yeah. the start of the season. Yeah. And they're all in the bottom half, except one, Chelsea, who had a change of ownership. Basically, you know, that's because people are very scared of getting relegated with their team because they don't want to lose the enormous amount of money that the Premier League uh, will give them. Mm. And don't forget that money doesn't just help you when you're in the Premier League, it helps you for up to two years afterwards because of the parachute payments. Yep. So you go into the Championship as the richest club in the Championship by dint of the fact that you've been relegated from the Premiership. Yeah. No, but why, why are they... This is the Premier League, with all the resources, all the knowledge... And so they're getting rid of coaches halfway through the season. Why are they so bad at finding the right fit? I mean, they invest a huge amount of money in the players to, to find the right fit in the team. But surely it's the club not being able to find the fit. Or, or what is fit in your experience? Well, what the, is the coach who fits that team? Well, the players, the managers who are leaving clubs have got nothing to do with the Premier League. The Premier League has got no interest whatsoever. Mm. In who's managing the clubs? Premier League is a, a commercial organisation put together to make sure that England, fortunately, has you know, one of the best leagues, if not the best league in the world, because yeah. it attracts the most interesting and most expensive players from all over the world. Yeah. Why the clubs operate in the way they do, well, that's partly because of what I've just told you, the fear of relegation and losing the money, or the thought of making more money and becoming even more powerful as a team, by getting into the Champions League or the Europa League, and making money that way too, and being able to attract, of course, the best players from other countries throughout the world, mm. because the very best players, you know, the ones who are costing £100 million plus, their aim is also to play in the Champions League as well as their national teams. And to do that, they've got to go to a club which can guarantee them that we'll be in the Champions League next year. And unfortunately, of the 20 Premier League clubs, not more than half a dozen, I would think, can give them some quite serious guarantee. Sign for us, and you will play Champions League football. Yeah. So, if you're a coach looking to to join a club, what what's your advice to a coach? You know, in the sense of what what should they be looking for to know that this is a good fit for me as a team, or is that just not the question? You're offered the opportunity, you <laughs> you go. <laughs> you know. I fear it's more that these days. I yeah. mean, of course, it's. There was a time I remember Stan Cullis at uh, uh, a managers and coaches conference many years ago uh, upbraiding someone who said, well, we didn't realise that the club we were going into mm. was going into liquidation and had financial problems. How were we to know? And he said, well, you should have gone to the, uh, where is it, Somerset House or wherever it is and looked at yeah, that and out, right. all that. Do your due diligence, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. think that's the case anymore. I don't think you do diligence. I think that... You take a chance and mm. to some extent you go into the job knowing this is an opportunity for me to A, make a lot of money and, and B, possibly reach the level that I would like to reach in yeah. terms of fame and celebrity. Yeah. But of course, if you do it as a young manager, you do limit your chances of long careers Yes, because unfortunately you get branded as a failure despite the yeah, fact yeah, that you exactly, might not yeah. be a failure. Yeah. Yeah. Quite often, managers aren't failures. It's the club itself that's the failure. Yeah. You just happen to be in that club to take part, if you like, in the failure that's been that's been generated by the way the club's been run. And coaches are, are an easy scapegoat. Teams are going down, down, down. That's that's, well, that's the that's the coach's fault. Yeah. Well, you know? but that's because that's because we we <laughs> proliferate the myth that. Managers have some magic wand mm. that's going to change bad players into good ones, a non-functioning team into a functioning team, and a club that's got lots of leadership problems into a club with good leadership. 
that's not going to happen. And basically, the coach that goes into a club, if he really wants to make an impact in terms of getting the type of players he wants to play for him, getting them sort of fit, as you mentioned, you've used the word fit, so I'll use the word fit, getting the fit within the team, maybe even the fit within the club that he's looking for, you're talking years. Yes. But there aren't years, you know, not unless you get off to a very, very good start. And if you get off to a very good start, then it's the opposite. Yeah. Then the world is placed before your feet and, you know, you can't do any wrong and people will give you all the money that you think needs to be spent because they're afraid of losing you because you suddenly have got the track record that other clubs are looking for and they know, these clubs, that if we let this one go, i.e. Klopp and Guardiola and Arteta in this moment in time, if we let them go, it's going to be hard to find the replacement, which you also alluded to. Mm. And sec secondly, you know, these people become more powerful as a result because the world's their oyster at the moment because they're working at Liverpool, Man City and Arsenal and earning enormous sums of money. But if it didn't go well, then it's across the water to Real Madrid, to Paris Saint-Germain, yeah, Bayern yeah, Munich. Yeah, yeah. Let's just look back, though, to, to, to your career, going back 40 years. And you talk about... 46, if we're going to be... 40, I was being yeah. polite. Four, 46, 46 years. Mm. And you talk about that risk. You know, you jump into a, a team and, and you take a risk. And, but on the other hand, you, you want it to work, particularly as a young coach. Right? So we go all the way back to Sweden. Your, your first team was Hampstead. It was. And um, so talk us a little bit about that. Is, uh, first, how does an unknown coach g get his first job? Because that's like any job this is the hardest thing how do i get my first job how did that happen and uh, it was also uh, a big challenge too but we'll talk about that in a minute it's a combination i suppose of three things i mean the first is the fact that i was very close friends with bob houghton yeah. who, yeah. who had been at malma for two seasons when i got offered the job at harmstad and had been enormously successful mm. he won the league in the first year and he did the double in the second year and had revolutionised a little bit the way they were playing football in Sweden because he, he moved away from the Bayern Munich model of man-to-man -man marking with a, a sweeper stroke libero who played behind everybody and covered all the mistakes to playing the sort of football that we've always played in England, or at least since as long as I can remember, which is much more of a zonal game where people take responsibility not only for a certain player, they take responsibility for space and where the ball happens to be. And he was the major influence, I think, in getting me the job. But there were two other influences. The, the second one was the English FA and Alan Wade, who at the time was the uh, director of football at the Football Association. He was the technical director of football. And uh, the club turned to him to check out the sort of recommendation of this unknown English guy, yeah. friend of Bob Houghton's, but no other real That's it. You see your CV. qualifications <laughs> to you know, push him our way. Yeah. And he was very good. You know, he, he gave them a, a very good reference, which helped. But I think the point, the most important thing was they couldn't find anybody else because the club was in such a lamentable state mm. that they didn't believe that I, I'm certain I wasn't their first choice. I think the Swedish coaches they turned to before me had said, well, thanks very much, but we don't think this job's going to lead to any success. Yeah. So they needed someone going into the job totally green, totally naive, I suppose, anxious to work, anxious to coach, anxious to do his best with whatever he sees in front of him. And that happened to be a 28-year-old Englishman. Yeah. Yeah, as you said, they were tipped for relegation. So you, you, you go in knowing that. Right? And you, you, you well, take they'd only survived the year before in goal difference. Yeah. And that was because they won their second to last home league game by five goals to one. And it was those four <laughs> it was those four goals which actually kept them above the above the relegation zone. So it was a purely purely on goal difference they'd survived. And they weren't they were they were known as the line dancer team because they were the team that constantly went up and down a bit <laughs> like Watford and Norwich you know, uh, uh. in our in our leagues. So you're stepping into this new club, or okay, your your first your first gig. This is it. This is your your time to prove yourself. So um, 
you have your, your coaching license. You, 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 yes, you did your course with the FA. Absolutely. And you step in first week with, with, with this team. How much that you learn from your coaching badge prepares you for that kind of challenge? Well, it, it was everything, really. I, I didn't have anything else. Although, to be fair, I had uh, uh, gone through a, a teacher's training program, so I suppose in terms of teaching and, 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 and pedagogics, I suppose mm. I had some sort of faint knowledge of that, but I was only at teacher's training college to coach football, really, so I, yeah. can't, I can't say that that was a major influence. Um, so really, that's all I had. So in terms of leadership, it was really almost non-existent. Yeah. But fortunately, you know, working in Sweden at that time with Swedish players who were part-timers anyway, they were playing the game, A, because of the love of it, mm. and B, because it supplemented their income in a, a decent way. Um, the pressures, if you like, from a leadership front perhaps were less great than they would have been if you'd have stepped into uh, a club at home here or, or somewhere yeah, else yeah, in yeah. Europe. So I think it was made easier in that respect. And luckily, the... The, sim the simple tenets of leadership, I suppose, uh, have been drummed into us from the English coaching courses, mm. which were quite simply to, to make certain that you treat people with respect, yeah. to make certain that you prepare your training sessions properly so that every player who's taken part in the training session can't walk off saying this was a complete waste of time in yes, terms yeah. of my yeah. chance of becoming a better player or a better team player. You went on to, um, you, you mentioned um, Bobby Hunt and uh, Malmo. So you went to Malmo. A long uh, while afterwards. A long it? while afterwards, you, you, you went into that team, and uh, big team. And it seems like Nordic football had continued to, to grow and develop, um, and you had a lot of you know, success with that team. Um, but again, when you went into the team, they, they had a major challenge. They weren't on the way up. No. They, they were struggling a little bit, and um, so how do you catalyze that change? I think they were struggling, you know? in, uh, struggling in the sense that you know they were still in a reasonable position in the, in the, in the best league, mm. but they hadn't won the league for I think it was um, eighty five. I think it was uh, was it about seventy seven, seventy eight. So it was seven or eight years I think since they'd won the league, mm. and that's a little bit like the Man United situation at the moment, if you like. I'm not saying that they are necessarily the Man United of, of, of Sweden. They're well, possibly more Newcastle in the sense that it's a very, a very fierce and uh, patriotic sort of area scorer. Mm. It was a long period of time before they didn't even take a player who'd not been born in the district of scorer. And even during the five years I was there, I don't think we had more than three or four that actually came from outside the district of scorer. So there was a, a fierce belief, if you like, in the team that this mm. team wins things because yeah, they had a yeah. very successful 70s. Um, so winning the league was important in 85, really, because it put us back to some extent on the map and then dented Gothenburg, who at the time was a big team, with Ericsson uh, in, the, in the two European finals. He was only for there for one, but it was his team that went on to the second one as well. So basically going into it was... Tricky in the sense that Bob and I had both probably developed something of a reputation during the 70s um, of being a little bit, uh, what's the right word here now, determined that you know, this is the way we need to play, this is what we have to do to win, and this is what you have to do. And flair, which was becoming a, a popular word, as it always is, I suppose, you know, was not something we were associated with. So one of my first challenges was to make certain that the players realised that it wasn't necessarily going to be exactly what they'd seen from the past. It was going to be a new version of it where the principles would still be very much um, followed and, and, and promoted. But there might be another aspect in terms of the attacking play, we might be a bit more interested in doing other things. So I remember one of the first things I did was to, to do sessions before the actual tactical session on players receiving the ball in the midfield and turning with the ball because that wasn't something that the, mm. the 
style of play in the past that encouraged it was more if you play into people marked into midfield that you played it back and then the next ball went forward so that was just a a little thing I remember doing which I was quite proud of at the time because it made the players think well hold on uh, maybe our uh, preconceived ideas about how it's going to be Mm. might not be quite like that how do you get the players on, on on board with that as as a new coach now coming coming in and these are good players yeah well, young players a lot of them unfortunately as well i mean it was a nice balance 85 was was less of a balance but as we move forward a lot of the players came through our academy because the, the the academy system if we call it it wasn't called an academy it was the youth teams mm. but the youth teams they really had a monopoly on, on the region of scorn everyone every kid who was even half decent in the region of scorn i wanted to play for malmo ff so so we had a, a fairly decent choice there. Even from abroad, I remember Yali Lippmann uh, coming to, we used to run a training session in the summer, um, which was almost like a trial as well to some extent, you know, for local players, yeah. uh, to see if they could get into that youth group, or for some players maybe coming from abroad we'd heard of, who we thought might want to come and, and play for us instead of the team they were playing for. And I remember Yali coming and spending a, a summer with us. He chose to stay at Rapers and uh, that was a good move because from Rapes he went to Ajax of Amsterdam and, mm-hmm. and not to us. But um, I think that it was fortunate in that respect that there was this, there was this very good group of young players yeah. coming through yeah. and they, you know, they they were used to coaching as well. That's the thing. Malmo, they'd been coached through Bob Houghton. They got coached afterwards through a very good coach, Keith Blunt. Mm. Then they got coached through Todd Grebe. So coaching was nothing different to them. It's part it of the culture they've grown up with. It wasn't just, can we yeah. have a five-a-side and yeah. forget about anything else and we know what we're doing. They expected to be coached. They expected to be given challenges. They expected to be told, I think you could do better in this way. I think if you want to be a better player, this is what you've got to concentrate on. Yeah. So it was a very good audience, if you like, for a coach in those yeah. days. And you know, it was there for you to mess up rather than for you. To but it fit you that, very well. It fit you with me your, your, as a coach. Yeah. Your, your, your approach. Let, let's jump on to, um, you know, uh, uh, let's talk about big, big clubs. Um, Inter Milan, which has got to be one of the biggest uh, experiences. Jumping into Italian football, Italian culture, um, and family-owned club, the Marathis, and what a, what a difference that must have been, going in from, from the Nordic game and then, well, I didn't go in for the Nordic. You know. I went in from Switzerland. I went yeah. in from, from six years in Switzerland ah, yes, and four right. years yeah. of that were, were yeah. very successful yeah. ones with the Swiss national team. So I went in with a lot of confidence. And furthermore, I went in um, chosen largely as a candidate by Giacinto Facchetti, who was also at the club when Malman knocked them out to the, the European Cup. And he sort of got to know of me then. And he was the one who championed me, I suppose, to... To Massimo Moratti, and luckily in the interview with Massimo, it went well, and he decided, yeah, this is the way I want my club to go, because he'd only been in the club himself about six or seven months at the time. He'd taken over the club, mm. and he'd taken over the coaches, and uh, I think he was a bit like the, the Chelsea situation, I guess, that he thought, right, I want to do something else, and I need now to find the person that suits me. And very fortunately for me, he, he, he chose me. It was a so, good relation. So, yeah, so it, it was a good basis on me. But it wasn't a good basis in terms of my background and preparing me for what Inter was and what Italian football Is was. Italian football that different? It was then. I mean, don't forget, it was like what the Premier League is today is what Serie A was then. The very best players in the world didn't come to England then. They went to Serie A. Yeah. That's, that's where the money was. You know, we, we earned more money in Italy than the England coaches and managers and players were earning. So, and it was the, the big league. Milan had dominated the Champions League for a number of years. So basically speaking, um, that was a, a difference. I, I think the, the mass media attention, of course, was something I'd not really experienced in either Sweden or Switzerland. That was... Not easy to deal with either. Um, luckily, the players were actually quite good mm. because in the first year, we didn't have so many of the famous names, the names that you could mention. I worked with. There weren't so many of them in the first year. 
It was Paul Ince, uh, there was Roberto Carlos, um, who else? There was a very young Zanetti who joined the club at the same time as me. And, of course, there was uh, Gianluca Pagliuca and Giuseppe Bergoli. But there weren't that plethora of names, which the following year we had. The first year was more about save they were yeah, on the well, way I down thought, when you yeah, were when you came down. in I and you, we did well that you year. had to turn around the team yeah, yeah. that was that was that was a that team was probably a better structured team in a way than the one that came after it because the big stars came in yeah, with well, the money that's and the, that's when the yeah. winters and the jorkevs and the zamoranos and uh, chiliarcus forza came paul was still there uh, galante who else did we have we had uh, anglomar you know, we had a lot more players coming. Oh, uh, Paolo Sosa. There was a lot of bigger name players. Ronaldo, Ronaldo came when I went back. The second time I went back, there was even bigger names. Yeah. But unfortunately, the club was not was moving away a little bit, I think. Unfortunately for someone like me, it would have been anyway. Mm -hmm. From the fact that this is a good group of players who do want to work together, it was becoming much more... Um, the ego side had to be taken into account because you had so many stars. You know, when you yes. when you've got Ronaldo and the type of people he had that he liked and were around him and the quality players he wanted to have at the club, and Diego Simeone on the other hand, it's a difficult balance. So it becomes a very there. different job. Yeah. So for, for, the, the reason for I went back, yeah. I was a third coach that year. The only reason I went back after Blackburn was because. Uh, <clears throat> Marcello Lippi, who'd agreed to take over, wouldn't come. He wouldn't come until the summer. He, he I think he saw it as a hornet's nest. So <laughs> he, he well, was to, it? He, he, it he was he right? I, guess. I suppose it was. Yeah. And yet, strangely enough, I met all those guys now in, in Qatar. I don't have a memory of it, particularly as being a happy time or mm. having a particularly good relationship with the players. One or two of the ones who'd been there for my first time, perhaps, but... Not so many of the new ones because I didn't have a lot of chance to get to know them. One and secondly, they knew I was a caretaker for yeah. three months, and that yeah. Marcello Lippi's on his way. And there was, was plenty of rumours knocking around that when Lippi comes, he's going, he's going, and he's going, and he's coming, and he's coming. And of course, yeah, yeah, all yeah. of that affects the players, and they knew that for me, I had nothing to do with it and had no effect upon it. Um, but strange enough, I bumped into no less than six of them. Because um, a lot of them had gone to FIFA mm -hmm. uh, or were working in in uh, top clubs, you know, people like Diego. Uh, Diego was there; he sat along from me, and so I got to meet them again. And I was quite surprised about the warmth of their greetings, if you like, and the you know that there seemed to be no feelings. Well, it didn't go so well when we were working together. It seemed yeah. to me we've. The water's passed under the bridge. We now seem to remember it is a wonderful time, and we Good were time. all great friends, and we were all perfect together. Yeah. If you if you move on to your time at Fulham, um, which you know a lot of lot of really positive times there uh, as you built the, rebuilt the club, but again when you went in, you're kind of getting this reputation of of kind of the turnaround magician. You you're they're not doing well, and uh, you know they. Your ex their expectations of you was to turn around this club, yeah. but it wasn't a good start um, no, according to the sure. statistics. So, you know, you, you you lose your first game, you only get nine points from your first thirteen games. Oh, yeah. What's going through your head there as 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 a coach? Are you how do you deal with the doubts or? Well, the strange thing that came after a very successful period as well. So, I'd actually decided not to to continue as as a, a coach on the field of play. Mm. I'd actually accepted an invitation to take Giacinto Fichetti's place as the right-hand man, if you could call it that, to, to Massimo Moratti and to go back to Inter. Yeah. So really my coaching and management career almost ended at the age of 60 because after a very successful spell with, with Finland um, and the previous successful spells, of course, with uh, where did we find that though, that Norway I was successful, of course. And in Copenhagen, I was successful. So I'd had one or two quite good successful spells where I felt quite confident about myself. I thought it was the time to stop now. It's been, it's been very good on the field of play. I'll go back to Inter and swan around, really, do some sort of job for Massimo. But then this job from Fulham came up. It was almost like, well, it came at the same time as two other job opportunities as well. And I suppose that's what made me start to think, Am I doing the right thing in stopping? Because these 
suddenly to find yourself confronted with three quite good job opportunities. Am I actually doing the right thing? Yes. The yeah, last yeah. one of those three, while I was debating, happened to be Fulham. And we happened to have a place, of course, in Richmond, which is stone's throw Stone from Mossborough yeah. Park. And uh, I've always quite liked Fulham from the days as a boy when I used to go and watch the Johnny Haynes and Tosh Chamberlain play from time to time on, on the bus from Croydon. So I had a soft spot for the club, I guess. Mm. And I thought, well, what what are the chances here for success? You know, like, They might be very high, but on the other hand, if I don't take the opportunity, I shall never know. Yeah. And secondly, I might be lucky, because in a lot of places I've gone to, I've found a very um, receptive group of players. Mm. Found players that when you get to work with them, they're... They're not hard to work with at all, yeah, yeah. and that goes for the good ones as well as the others. So I was very fortunate coming to Fulham. And I think when you go to a club, you do need a, a one or two people who are going to take some sort of responsibility, if you like, yeah. for helping you out and believing very, very much in what you're saying and what you're uh, predicating to them. Uh, and they can help in the dressing rooms, if you like, yeah, to they keep that, that and also yeah. to maybe calm down the, the doubting voices, you know, yeah. we don't want to do it this way. And um, I was lucky enough to sign a guy called Breda Hangerland, who was very yes. important, whom I knew from, from Norway, from my team at Viking, and had done very well. I found some very, very good players there that were very much underrated. You know, I'm thinking of Simon. But Davis. they're leaders, as you say, yeah. as well, not just being good Davis, players, Davis they can Hughes. lead the team. People, yeah. people actually have been dismissed by the club, you know, Chris Baird, Aaron Hughes, uh, Simon Davies, these sort of guys weren't even really that that uh, important, the club thought. But but finding finding uh, Hangerland, finding Murphy and, and, and finding Brian McBride, that gave a, a very strong <coughs> backbone to the team, yes. if you like. Yeah. And those three were all very, very good players, really understood football. Better younger, uh, perhaps you know, great Potential, but co- but you Danny, need that back man as a Murphy coach. You had need it that. all behind yeah, him, and yeah. Brian McBride had it all behind him, and they were the ones I think that helped turn things around, as well as quite a strong decision which we took early on, and that is to move aside the ones that we knew were a not good enough in terms of their playing ability, in our opinion, mm. but as a result had a very high opinion about their playing ability were going to be a problem, if you like, in terms of the sort of work we wanted to do on the training field because we, we made it clear to the players early, early on there's only one way out of this. You know, we're not going to buy our way out of it. We bought, we bought three players in the transfer window in January when I came. We bought Greta Hangerland, we bought Eric Neverland, and we took a free transfer from in Finland, a guy called Tony Kallio, who was a backup for Konchesky. Um And basically, so there's no way out of it it's not going to be the players we're yeah. buying, bringing in. You guys who are here, you're the ones who've got to do it. So yeah. how are we going to go about it? Well, in our opinion, we go about it by becoming a really well-organised team with each of us really understanding our role in the team and our teammates' roles in the team and putting all our eggs into that basket. But, of course, it didn't work straight away. It yeah, that takes time. Right. Took, yeah. Took time. Yeah. I told a story the other day, actually, it always makes me laugh. I don't know if it makes other people laugh, but it was after I'd been at Fulham for, uh, as you say, it was quite a number of games before we started to turn it around. And Fulham was quiet. The, the crowd were quiet, you know. There was none of that raucousness mm. that came towards the end as we headed towards the European Cup the following year. It was a quiet crowd, quite a, quite a dignified crowd, really. Um, and we're losing one game. and We had a player called Kamala, Diamancy, Diamancy Kamala, who'd been bought for quite a lot of money for West Brom, but hadn't succeeded as far as the club were concerned, and say not as far as the fans were concerned. Yeah. And we didn't think he was good enough to play either, so he was on the bench as far as we were concerned. And one day we were losing uh, midway through the second half, I suppose, or might have been at the start of the second half, and a voice rings out from the crowd, Hodgson! So I turned around and looked at this guy glaring, and he's looking at me, you know, with that sort of angry spectator face. Mm. He went, get camera on. <laughs> and I looked at him, 
And like you glared at him and glared back. Like, Shall I say something? I thought, no, ignore it, you know, show a little bit of dignity here. But he could see I was angry about it. Well, I forgot about it. And now the game is nearing the end and we're still losing. We need a goal. I think we might have only been losing by a goal, but we were losing and not showing too much signs of getting back into the game. Mm. So we decided to give it a go. You know, well, what have we got? You know, what could we do? Well, we might as well give Joe a chance. You know, Joe Cameron, see what he can Nothing do. Nothing to lose. Quick, you yeah. Know? Yeah. And in fact, he ended up saving us at Man City. It's a later story. So he's getting warmed up on the touchline. And the voice rings out again. Hodgson! And now, I'm, <laughs> now I'm angry this time. I'm really going to have a go. So I spun me on. He went, I was only joking. <laughs> <laughs> but that sums full him up for me. Yeah, time. yeah. But that relationship too with the fans. What, what is the relationship between a, a, a coach and the fans? And, and it, or is it just something in the background there? Yeah, it's in the background. Yeah. I think I was actually it's the players who, who get your attention. It took me by surprise. Really. I, I wasn't aware of the sort of level of affection that I now realise mm. that I, I had. It took a long while, maybe towards the end, you know, as we were having that European run, and I suddenly started to realise, hold on, you know, they, they like me here, and, uh, you know, we're, we're well regarded. But a long period of time went by before I actually was aware of that. You know, I, they were there, they seemed to be fine, and um, obviously they helped us towards the end, but yeah. it was that... Really, Fulham survived quite simply through the last four or five games where suddenly everything seemed to click. I want to ask you about one of those games because I think you mentioned it too. Uh, it came up in the discussion yesterday. Um, was it, it, you were struggling that, that, that first season, relegation was, was close. You had yeah, to we, win the penultimate game against Manchester City. So, yep. obviously, these are the you've been in thousands of games. D do you remember every game or are there just no. some? ones that jump out, like a game like yeah. that, you have to win it, your reputation is on the line, and you're against Manchester City, tough opposition, and you're 2-0 down at half-time. What do you say to the, to the team when they come in to the dressing room at half-time? And how, how do you keep calm about this? Do, or don't you, or do you let go? Or, well, What do you I, say to teams in that well, situation? I remember that dressing room very well, of course. I remember the... the disappointment on the face of the players because we, we hadn't been doing that badly and it, and it wasn't the Man City of today, I mean they had some very good players but it wasn't the, they weren't, pardon me the dominant force that they've become in recent years but still, you know, a team that we expected to do much better than us but we hadn't given up hope that we can go there and, and get a result and keep ourselves in the mix for the last, was it the last game or the last two games, I can't remember so to come in at half-time 2-0 down, uh, not having played that badly, but 2-0 down, and mm -hmm. suddenly seeing the faces of those players, I, I felt enormous sympathy for them. I think it's quite important. If you're going to be successful with a club, you need to develop some sort of bond mm -hmm. where it doesn't become me and you. Right? you know, you're know, you okay as long as you're doing well and I'm there yes, for doing yes, well. Yes. But when yeah. you're not doing very well, then I'm going to protect me. So I realised we were all in this together. And I just remember saying to them that, you know, that I think we, we talked about some tactical elements, you know, but I remember saying we're not doing that badly. It's, you know, don't, don't run away mm. with the thought that you're doing very badly. But we can't either get away from the fact we now have a hill to climb. And, you know, it's not looking good. But we've got to set ourselves some sort of challenge. So let's try and go out and win the second half. Because we don't know if if we were to start off in our attempt to win the second half by scoring a, a, an early goal, mm -hmm. it might change the... Because one of the biggest myths in football is... Well, there's several myths, aren't there? You know, we, we learn to accept myths these days. We learn to accept truisms or, or, or platitudes. One of them is that, that uh, goals don't change games. They do. Referee decisions don't change games. Well, they do. Mm things even out, no they don't. All of these things yeah. are, are very, very important because the mental aspect of the game is so important. And what's going through your head and how you're feeling and you know how you consider your chances is gonna vary even during the course of ninety minutes. Mm. So it's coming in at half time two nil, you can do two things. You can you 
can you know, draw the blanket over yourself, if you like, and say, that's me finished. Or you can, if you're lucky, engender that type of mentality. Well, there's still something to play for. Yeah. And we're not dead yet. And until we're dead, we're not going to accept the shroud. And uh, luckily, that's what the play On that did. day you did it, right? It's 3 2, right? The yeah. Amancy yeah. camera played a very important part. <laughs> With your friend in the stand. So I always wonder the about the, the guy in the stand if he ever pays tribute to, to John <laughs> Cunningham for that. Let's just move on to uh, to national teams. So that's the club scene. Um, coaching national team Switzerland and and the England team uh, it's very different for a coach right it's a very different yeah. approach you don't have much time bringing the players together but what's the key do you think to 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 that well that's all about selection of course selection and fortune um, in Switzerland the team hadn't been very successful but in actual fact had some 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 very good players at a good age of their lives you know they were young but they weren't 17 18 19 they were 22, 23, 24, they had some experience. And the other beauty there was, to some extent, there was two, two important factors. One, there wasn't enormous pressure to select players. You, know, they, you, know, you need the national team to do well um, over a, a period, I suppose, of qualifying and then into the tournament. You probably need between 16 and 20 players. Mm -hmm. You don't need 40. You don't need every one of your 16 or 20 being questioned at every juncture. Is he the right man or is he the? Is this one yeah, better? You know, because this one scored a hat-trick on Saturday. It never ceases to amaze me. I look at the, the best defenders of the week um, in that little list that mm. people give on, on, must be Sky Sports News, I suppose. And often it's a, it's a defender who scored a goal. You know, he's he's got the maximum points this week because yeah. he's scored, he scored a goal. A goal. Yeah. Um, so we didn't have didn't have that sort of problem to deal with, which was which was very fortunate. Uh, and second thing that helped, the, the, I made it clear that a bit like Fulham, that you know we we aren't going to go toe to toe with Brazil and Italy and Germany and France and England and say well we're gonna we're gonna match you because our players are every bit as talented, every bit as skillful, every bit as experienced. As your players are, um, you know, we didn't have Alan Shearer you know, on, on our team. We had a guy called Arjun Knup, had a very talented young player who'd gone to buy at Erdingen and been bought from, from to Borussia Dortmund. But Borussia Dortmund at the time weren't the Borussia Dortmund of today. Uh, so that's what the sort of thing we had. And mm -hmm. so I said, if we're going to do it, it will be because we've got something that, you know, we've been able to generate. Maybe some of these other clubs teams can't because they're bringing players in from lots of different clubs. Mm -hmm. We could become a sort of a club. So it's, the, it's like a club like then. A you try and create that system. same. And what they did feeling, was yeah. they gave me the the the, the, federal, the 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 association was run by three different bodies. There was like sort of the Premier League, if you like, i.e. The, the, the top league. Then there was a. A group under which I suppose you'd call the EFL, although they were actually below the EFL, and then of course there was the grassroots side of things as well. And at the meetings we got together, I persuaded them that if I could get a bit more time with the mm. players on top of that work we were doing when the games came around, you know, when the when the qualifiers and you got your four or five days with the players, whatever it might be, if I could get a few more days mm. at different times, What's no matter, yeah. just to coach. Yeah. And they were very good for, for the first two years at leading up to the World Cup before the players started to move abroad because they were spotted and they went to the bigger clubs. At the time, we only had you know, two players in that period, 92 to 94, playing abroad. One was Kubalai Turkelman, was playing at Bologna in the Italian second division. And the other was Stefan Chabrizar playing at first Erdogan and then, and then Dortmund. So all the others were playing in Switzerland. But of course... So really, there was no excuse. Not yes, to be yeah. And what that also did, apart from giving me the chance to work with the ones I thought were going to help us to win, it also gave me a chance to look at some others. So the ones that you would see on the on the matches on a Sunday and recognise and say, hey, he's interesting, he could yeah. be good. Three days with him in training made a big, big and difference. Then you know, because yeah. then you knew, you knew the man. You, you didn't just say, well, he's he's got some skill. Yeah. You got the feeling... Is he going to be able to bring his skill set to us yes. and help yeah. us? And is he going to fit in? 
with a group. So it's really having that time as a coach yeah. is, is, is the key thing. And that was right? specific yeah. to that period of time. Yeah. You'll never get that. I, I can't imagine. I mean, at Finland, I, I didn't get that at all. Finland was just the opposite. I mean, Finland was a, an ageing team with some exceptional players. You know, Sammy Hoopier was an exceptional player. Yari Lippmann was an exceptional player. And there was a few others in there, you know, I mean, uh, Petri Passan and then, you know, people like that uh, who, who'd, who'd had careers in England and Germany. They were knocking on 30, you see Eskeline and the guy. Already in their 30s, these guys. Plenty of games behind them and plenty of failure behind them because Finland had never got close yes, to anything. Yes, they were qualifying, right. So yeah, yeah. just to have a, a qualifying campaign where we, we got within within uh, one point of qualifying yeah. was, was important for them. Yeah, I think you're also saying that's one of the gifts of a, of, of a coach, right, is to be able to, each team you've gone into, you, you've had an approach which is, has, has the same basis but is open to figuring out what the situation is. And isn't that the, sort of the key to coaching for you? And so if you, you have to have your way, but you've, you've got to be really sensitive to the culture and what's there and how the players are and putting all the pieces together. Yeah, yeah I think that's a very good summary of the situation. I think that's, that's what's needed. It's, it's an easy thing to talk about or, or, or say. It's a much harder thing to yeah, bring to about. Do. Yeah. And, you know, you're going to depend upon a lot of other factors. A lot of it is, is an element of chance as well. And I think you, you mentioned young coaches. I think they need to be aware of that. You know, it's, it might not be the fact that you're no good that the team doesn't succeed. It yes. might just be that you've moved into this club at a time when you've, you're have you obliged to deal. Often young coaches, or any coach, when he goes into a club, he, he gets a job for one or two reasons. One, the previous manager's left because he's been so successful that he's been poached by a bigger club. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a better scenario than yeah. the second one. But the second one's far more common, and that is that the club has decided, that's the leaders of the club, in their wisdom, have decided that the reason we are winning with this fine group of players that we have here is because the manager, yeah. the coach, doesn't know how to deal with them. And that's why, of course, quite often those those clubs get through quite a few coaches because one day they're going to realise that perhaps it's the group that we've given the coaches to work with that maybe aren't quite up to the job. But, of course, you as a, a coach going in, <laughs> you're not going to be able to go in and say, right, uh, these five out, yeah. and you buy me these five in the next transfer window. That's unlikely to happen. And even less so if one of those players happens to be a fan favourite. Yeah. But some fan favourites, they you remain fan favourites for ages. It, it was brought home to me now, watching a game on the TV abroad in a, in a, in a hotel with some people around me, and um, one or two of them were, were, were Chelsea fans, and it was a Chelsea game. And I remember the woman, every Chelsea player that she mentioned was fantastic. And the one that really brought it home to me was Emerson. She went, oh, I loved him, Emerson. Fantastic! What a great guy! What a great player! And I thought, is this the same Emerson that I remember at Chelsea, who didn't get a game and was mm. shepherded here and there and everywhere? But I mean, that's that's what you're up against. You yep, know? Now, yep. the fans they you can't accept the the ones they lift onto that pedestal are actually necessarily the right people to make that club there. And I say Brian McBride wasn't lifted onto a pedestal at uh, Fulham. When I came to Fulham, Danny Murphy wasn't on a pedestal, as far as the fans were concerned. The ones that were on a pedestal were far less useful to me, actually, in terms mm -hmm. of winning than those two. So you've got to be lucky, in a way. Yeah, My yeah. luck was that I, I managed to, to move aside the one or two that had shared a pedestal, yeah. and they didn't, therefore, affect our chances of going forward and doing well. You talked about you know young players and, and the, you know, the... the being as a coach, um, you know, bringing these players into the game. and, and what, what does a young player need from a coach when they're coming in? Or is it sink or swim as a player? It shouldn't be, should it? It shouldn't be sink or swim. I mean, it should be, should be uh, a lot more logical than that. I mean, you, you go a long way before you get to that stage where you're on the touchline and you know, you, you've been put on the bench. You might have had a couple of games on the bench and you might have been watching the league from the bench. And that moment when the day comes and someone says, 
hold on, we've seen enough now. We still like you very much. We we still believe you're the type of player we need. So here's your chance. It's given it should that, be that much belief, more logical yeah. Yeah. than just saying, well, and if it goes well, we'll keep you. But if it doesn't go well, we'll forget all about you and we'll turn to the next one. It's got to be more, mm. more uh, well thought out than that and more considered than that. Yeah. Um, but what the young player needs is, of course, he needs the, the confidence and the knowledge that I am being supported from behind. Someone's got my back here. So yeah. if I go in, it doesn't go quite so well. They're not going to chop my head off. They're going to keep working with me and give me a chance again. Uh, I think that probably is the most Im important factor. But they also, you, every player going onto a field of play needs to feel confident that he knows exactly what's required of him. Yeah. And that's not just what the manager's telling him. It's his teammates as well. So you know, when, when, the, when the young left back goes on to the field of play, he might think he knows mm -hmm. what a left back needs to do. But it's very useful for him. If the centre back alongside him is giving him some advice Riding and making him, yeah. him feel, look, yeah. you know what we're doing here. You know, you know what our our aim is. You know that when the ball goes there, as a team, yeah, this yeah. is what we're looking to do. So we'll help you. I'll never forget the, the debut I made in South Africa all those years ago. And in front of me were two players that I'd, well, one I'd I'd, I'd mentioned before. I used to travel from Croydon to watch him play for Fulham, Johnny Haynes. And the other guy in front of me was uh, was was Tony Coleman. And I didn't know what South African football was going to be like. I didn't know much about And it was a, a pre-season friendly because those two guys were playing for the champion team, Durban, and they were doing a, um, a tour of Northern Transvaal. And I'd just come out to play for another Northern Transvaal team. They were short of a left back. So they rang <laughs> the manager up and said, you haven't got a left back you can send us to play in this friendly. And they sent me. I'll never forget that day, in particular, Johnny Haynes, it was before the game and a little bit nervous and not quite knowing what to say and where to be. And Johnny Haynes came and said, he said, you playing left back today, son? I said, I said, yeah, yeah, I am actually. He said, we said, well, we'll just keep it simple. He said, he said, every time you get it, he said, have a look up. He said, I'll be there, just give it to me. He said, and then stay put. If I'm struggling, I'll give it back. He said, Otherwise, I'll turn and get on with the game and you'll be okay. And I think that was probably one of the nicest <laughs> things anyone could, could say. Yeah, yeah. Because the manager didn't send it me at all. I'm going to hand you over to Alf uh, now, um, because we're talking about the future and development. Of course, you know yep. Alf's years of expertise in developing young players, and uh, so let's just shift the pivot a little bit to youth development. So, um, Roy, uh, without aging us, uh, I've known you s so many years, and um, between us, I'm not going to say how many years. Um, but what I like to talk about and my interest um, for these 40 years has been how can we develop a more effective, better coaches, teachers, and thus then those developing better players. Um, and especially between um, the ages of 8 to 21. So um, we talked last time about... Um, this whole approach. Uh, so you, when you were a coach of England, a coach of Liverpool, coach of all the inter, inter um, you depend on players, graduated players. If you take kinder, if you like education, football education, just like education, you, you start a kindergarten, you go to university, um, you depend on university, somebody developing those players. So, um, Really, I'd like to discuss um, some ideas with you on how, what advice we can give to um, coaches who coach that age players. Um, so um, if I can split it in two parts, um, grassroots, let's start with grassroots, 99.9% .9 globally um, of participants are grassroots, uh, coaches, players, and parents involved. Um, what, what do you think we can, what advice can we uh, give um, to improve their situation? In what respect? In that, um, what do they need? For example, they need money, obviously, for fields. Um, they need referees training. All the things that I hear um, when, <coughs> when I do clinics. Um, th that, what advice can we 
can we give? Well, I don't know where that money is going to come from. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, I think it's quite easy to accept that we lack fields, we, we, we lack opportunities for mm. people to play. Um, I don't necessarily think we lack a desire to play. Although, having said that, that that's waning simply because the competition's greater now. Yeah. You know, the, the competition of the of the uh, computer and the computer game and the people coming home from school mm. and going straight to their room and playing computer games is mm. a, a major competitor mm. for the young person who we would like to see outside practicing sport. Yeah. So that, I don't quite know how you combat that. I don't know quite how you force governments and local councils to put money into those things. I think it, any campaign that is pushing for that, and I actually am, uh, I suppose I'm some sort of patron for the Level Playing Fields Association. I'm certainly a patron for the Handicapped uh, Association that, that looks after helping handicapped people get to premiership games in a in a more civilised and dignified way. So my my heart is with those people, but I don't quite know what the, the message has to be because it seems to be very, very hard these days to get local councils and governments to open their purses to anything of that sort of nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think we should keep campaigning, of course, so I'm a great believer in it. Yeah. Um, I don't know a lot about grassroots football, but to be honest, you know, my whole career has been spent at the professional end. I don't even know a lot about coaching at that younger level. It would only be once again until people have reached academy apprentice level that I could start to have some sort of uh, input in terms of knowing what I'm talking about. But the one thing that's always concerned me about the coaching of young children is, is one the influence of parents on the touchline, mm. B, the type of people who are running those teams and you know what damage they might be doing to the children because parents, I think, need to accept. And, you know, academies these days taking players so young, it would concern me as a parent that, you know, my child at the age of six or seven is now running around, you know, with his Chelsea, Arsenal, Liverpool, Man United shirt on, believing that my future's mapped out, I'm going to be a professional player. And yet I would know that your chances are unbelievably slim. Yes. Because, you know, from being from being a very good, talented, skillful young player, so many things are going to happen in your life between the age of six and the age of 16 when it might start to really count. Yeah. And not least of all, physical. I mean, people of different sizes. You know, you... you the, uh, there's a, there's a rugby player who, who does a lot of emceeing and you know, he's about six foot five and wide as a door and he jokes, you know, rugby was a great game when I was eight or nine because I was still six foot three and the others yeah, were, yeah. were knee high to a grasshopper. Yeah. There's, a, there's that element, there's so many elements involved. Yeah. And I think maybe, certainly football clubs, and I don't know if they do that or not, I don't know, you might say to me, well they do. I think that when they take any player in and say, we'd like to put your child on our program and sign him up with our under sevens, under eights, sure. under nines, that we do this and you put in a disclaimer. All we're doing is we're giving you some coaching training mm. with our club. Mm. We're not telling you he's going to play for us. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the conversations we've had, um, and I'll leave grassroots after this, but um, that actually football is used really uh, to – improve obviously health and you know yes. the the cry the, it's it's uh, you mentioned the, uh, the iphone and ipad and and i've got um, four grandkids and they're all on that right um whereas you and i had nothing well we had other things but mainly it was sport right that was our outlet right um so i think that in grassroots it's just to get parents and and um whoever's going to fund what you're saying um, to realise that that it has a huge impact on health, and and c currently now we're talking about the National Health Service and being overpowered, etc. So actually trying to encourage you know sport, uh, and there is a difference, I think, in, with, certainly in the UK with private schools 
having an abundance of sport and stage schools not. I mean, you and I grew up with schoolboy football, right? I mean, that that's almost gone in state schools. Well, private we, schools yeah. oft, often have good facilities, don't they? Yes. Yeah. My, one yeah. of my brief teaching experiences was at a public school in right. Dulwich, and right. you know, the facilities were yeah. incredible. Yeah. There's no worry then about, well, is there a field we can train yes. on? Yeah. We even had five courts, yeah. five courts. So, I mean, that, 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 that's very different. Mm. But I think the, these are obviously very, very important factors. There's no doubt about that. But the mental health aspect's important. Yeah. And I think that I would want um, all the coaches at any club I was at that were taking responsibility for very young people to make it clear to the players that, that you know, um, we're working to become better players. Yeah. But we're also working to become uh, fitter, healthier, and good colleagues, because I'm not using your team ability so that you know we have the best under-10 team in England. What I want is I want a group of players who are mm. enjoying their football, continuing to play football and getting better at football. And I think if you move away from professional clubs, mm. and just all the other clubs in grassroots doing a fantastic job, mm. you know, people giving up their time, giving up their taking a lot of interest, taking mm. coaching badges probably, so I mean, just to be able to be there. Yeah. They need to realise that, that they're not doing that job necessary to produce the next David Beckham. Yes. They're doing it because these kids love to play football. And if anything, you should be trying to produce good um, spectators for the future so that when the kids go to watch matches, they've got some idea yes. of what they're doing. So you're, you're producing better people, healthier people, mm. and better spectators. Mm. Because let's be realistic, you know, we all know what the percentage chance yeah. of going from being a talented footballer to becoming a, a full-time top professional. Yes, less than 1%. They're unbelievably yeah, yeah, small. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. have to be realistic on that. Mm. That shouldn't stop us trying to help people enjoy the game, right. get better at the game. Yeah. Because there's no doubt that to really enjoy games, you've got to have some sort of understanding of them. Yes. And that's why, for me... You know, when people say, well, about rugby, I'll say, look, I've got nothing against rugby. I can never really enjoy rugby. I don't fully understand yes, the game. Yeah. I've got no... Someone would need, really, to give me a real insight into what rugby is. Mm. I can enjoy tennis. So I played a lot of tennis. Mm. And, you know, never... Mm. not saying at a high level, mm. but I can understand that. So yeah. I can watch tennis. But you need to know, really, a little bit of what's going on in the game. And someone needs to teach you that at an early age. I think that's a great point, but but I also think that it's you know, if I if I thought of one word in in all my career that that is important, and that's love loving something. You know, yes. when when you love something, you want to do it more, and when sure. you do it more, you get better, and then you want to do it more. Sure. You know that that's that sort of uh, and and that's why you know one of the things that you and I talked about uh, often is we, it, I'm basically a drill designer, so when when you're designing a practice. Um, it's, and especially between the ages of eight and fifteen, I think that that you need to consider, you know, the DNA of that drill. Well, it should be fun, um, and w which means you know sure. it should be com maybe competitive. Uh, but it should uh, you know no waiting time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think true. I think all those for for you and me. I think even at our age, we still love being on the pitch, right? And and therefore the DNA, the drill that we do is important. But for young players, it's especially important to have that. If you like something, you love it, you'll do it. If it's about, boring, you won't. The thing about drills is is that yeah. you know it's the point you made there about the time factor mm. and also the weather in this country. Sure. I'll never forget uh, <laughs> Terry Venables watch, on a major coach's course watching a, a demonstration coaching session. Mm. It was a drill, it was a, a shooting drill right. where we stood in line and yeah. the ball. And we came up, I actually gave up. I, I used to like taking part in all the practices, but I was getting so few chances to shoot that in yeah. the end I, I moved back to the side and joined Bobby Houghton talking to Terry Venables. And I don't forget, Terry Venables said to me, do you know what they call this practice? And I said, no. He said, they call it the Crombie. <laughs> and I said, the Crombie? He said, yeah, he said, because when you do this in the wind, you have to buy every player an overcoat. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, yeah, well, that's, uh, I've never forgotten Fromby practices. I, um, <laughs> at, at, at professional level, drills was difficult. Yeah. Because 
the hardest sessions you, you can coach um, at professional level of drill practice. Yeah, yeah. You know, ones where passing practices or those sort of things, because you have to really push the players at all times. You have to coach almost every pass. Yes. Because if you just set the drill up and move back, mm. you're actually engendering bad habits. Mm. 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 Get mm. sloppy, people don't yes. can send their first touch enough, the pass is not quite where it yeah. should be, they don't put the right pace on the pass. Because they're just used to like bomb here I go, I run there, yeah. bomb here I go there. So I used to say to the coaches who used to do that, if you're gonna do it, you better make certain that you're working your socks off. Because when you go into more tactical practices, some of the way that the players are reacting with each other, it takes care of things to a certain extent. Uh, so that let's move on to sort of the elite development, if you like, which is uh, also an area that you and I have had, had so many years' experience in. Um, um, and uh, to that point, you know, use of space, again, going on to drill, you, advice for, for coaches and when they're working with better players, uh, certainly from 12 to, to 21, is the use of space, constricting space, making them play in smaller spaces. Yes. I know Pep... Um, uh, advocates this, and and I found it very useful in designing drills. Um, so, th th but um, what I really wanted uh, to, to to further is the conversation we had before. Um, so I've done a series of podcasts with uh, uh, Arsene Wenger, Ozzy Ardiles, uh, my dear friend Gerald Houllier, who we both know and who's passed, um, um, and 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 of course yourself. Uh, so all these years we've been in the game um, and w what we were talking about in previous podcasts is um, what, why is the conversion rate um, between 12 and, say, professional contracts, 17, so low? So you, you and I, uh, we accept the fact there's not enough jobs to fill. It's supply and demand. There's not enough jobs. But... Um, I want to get onto the question, and, and I think with Arsene especially, I had this conversation about the definition of talent, because when we were talking about this conversion rate, we accepted that um, any boy in any country, and you, between you and I, we worked in 20 countries, so it, it's not specific, uh, um, has talent, otherwise there wouldn't be an academy. but. Uh, often, um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about something, you have to define what it is because the other person you're talking to m may not have that same interpretation. How do you define talent as, as far as uh, going to a professional academy? Well, I suppose it's specific, really, to the type of position you play in the team. I mean, the sort of talent or skills you're looking for in your left winger might mm. be the same skills and talent you're looking for in your centre back or your goalkeeper. So I suppose you define talent quite simply as having that quality and that ability to play the game that sets you a bit higher than the average person. Yeah, so to start, get yeah. back to talent, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it all depends upon how you want to define the word. Mm. I mean, there's no doubt that any leadership books will tell you, and we've all read them, I'm sure, and mm. all coaches do these days, but they... Think about reading leadership books, they just tell you the same thing that you've known all along, and that is that talent's just a start. Mm. You know, mm. it, it takes talent to get to the top, but it takes a lot more than that to stay there. We all know that. Um, I don't think it's very difficult to identify talent, and the people who are doing the talent identification these days are, are really very, very good at it, yes. much better than we were. If I remember looking for players for, for Bristol City in the 1980s and thinking about players the Crystal Palace a couple of years ago, there's an enormous difference, you know, not least of all in the help we're, we're given. Mm. So I think that in future, uh, a lot of the emphasis is going to be, right, we've found some talent. Mm. We've got players here that we think possibly have got the talent to become better players and to become good players for our club. How now are we going to look after them and what areas can we work in yes. where we haven't necessarily worked in the past yes. that will help us? You, you talk about spatial awareness. I mean, why, how is it that someone, I mean, that, that we, the other day someone was telling me about the, the amount of scans that 
the better players yes. do. You know, we're looking around, they move in their head. We've always said to players from the early days, from my Harmstead days, you know, be aware, look over your shoulder, move your head, turn mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. but not quite to the same extent as we're talking about now. Someone told me about Stephen Gerrard's um, ability the other day to scan so many things in a matter of small seconds. Yeah. They're the type of things we're becoming more and more aware of. Yes. And we're becoming more aware of the physical side as well. I mean, if you compare the 1980s when I came back to England, you know, Bristol City, who'd actually been seventh in the Premiership <laughs> the year before I came, they were sixth or seventh in the Championship at Christmas, got relegated, and the manager got sacked, and Bob Houghton and I came into a team just about to go into liquidation a few months later. So in a space of eight months, all that had changed there. But if I compare the physicality of that side mm -hmm. with the way the players are today, it's enormous. Mm -hmm. That's no fault of those players. They mm -hmm. were fit players. They were every bit as fit mm -hmm. as any team in the championship. We didn't lose games because teams were fit than us. But if you compared them with the players you see today, because everything moves forward. Mm -hmm. You know, of course they're fitter today. Mm -hmm. Of course they're stronger. Of course they're more athletic. The big question, I suppose, now, if, you, if I was involved in some sort of talent identification I want someone to help me to say well look how is this lad going to develop in terms of his mental awareness his ability to to work things out mentally in that very short space of time on the field mm. and how is he going to go how's it going to work out for him in terms of the other things it's going to require he's going to require to become a professional football player how is he going to deal with the the mental setbacks has he got the resilience? How can we build up his resilience? How can we make him more aware that, that you know, there are highs and lows? How are we going to help him deal with the highs and then deal with the lows? All of those things, really, because at the end of the day, the world is full of people who will tell you, I could have been a very good footballer because I had the talent. Yes, yes. Uh, and I think that this whole... Is, is, w w what it's led me to believe, just a personal opinion, is obviously the, the technical aspect is the, the ABC, you yes. know, receiving the ball, passing the ball, running with the ball. Um, and I think, if, you know, you knew Will, you know me, uh, for 40 years we, 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 with Kerber, we've tried to build a curriculum that, that is based on that. But what I've realised since um, meeting my friend, Dr. Peter Bain, a neurologist, was that... Um, the the even the technical aspect is based on the it's the brain that learns the brain that sends the message the mm. brain the, the the brain that that wires automatic unconscious skills which gives you more time and space because you've done it so much so, and you can't do it at twenty years old it's it's got to be probably between five and twelve years old thirteen years old um, so I've, I've realised that but what I'm really interested in is and and you've touched on it that these individual techniques need an element or uh, uh, dependent on decision making because it's a team game and it's when and where you do things. And then the question comes, can you teach that? And um, it gets back then to drill DNA. So that a t a, a t years and years uh, so we, we, before Will and, and, and myself and Charlie, we worked on drills and I look at those drills now. They, they're still good. They're still good for warm-ups, but they lack a decision-making process. You know, for example, by adding four goals, it's better than playing with two goals. Uh, by adding colours, you, you give options. Um, so, um, for for your, your and me uh, uh, talking about giving advice to coaches, um, isn't that important? That when you look at your drill library. Don't only look for repetition, but look for some element of decision making with that repetition. Oh, without a doubt, I've always believed that. I mm. mean, I think that mm. the no doubt that you need the technique to yeah. execute right. the necessary pass mm. or, or, or shot. Mm. If it's shall I shoot or shall I pass? Yeah, you need the skill to do it, or the the technique to do mm. it. But more and more, I think, in, in the, the higher level you go. It's about players' ability to make the right decisions, yes. to know yeah. when to pass it, yes. to know what position to take up, to know which way to control the ball when it comes. You know, when they can when they can take a a, a slightly 
longer touch to get yeah. them away from someone coming in to challenge them or, yeah. or, or when they need to keep them very close to their body. All of those type of things which are, you know, you could go on forever naming the examples. Yeah. But there's no question in my mind, never has been. Mm. It's about decision making. That's why I've always been wary of, I, I like drills that bring in aspects of play. Mm. For example, the drills that will involve maybe a midfield player passing the ball to a, a fullback and then the interaction between the fullback and mm. maybe a centre forward and mm. a wide midfield player, where the next ball's going, where the next runs come. I've always been interested in those sort of drills. The actual drills where you're just passing between A and B, although I've done many in, in, yeah. in over the years, I've become less and less enamoured of them. Other than for warm ups, I think they're very good for warm ups. Yes, yes. And I think yeah. for younger players, they can be very good if you if you're prepared to go in and really encourage them to do the the right things. Mm. And even even the, the simple drills we've all accepted. It, uh, any passing drills we, we we I did in the last fifteen twenty years would be more based on a on a uh, passing with opposition. So. Six v four, yes, uh, yes, yes. three teams in different colours, or mm. those type of things where mm. you're moving around and you are passing, mm. and you shouldn't be that pressured in the passing because you know you've got more players in your team, but you still have to make decisions. The ball's coming towards mm. you. Where do I control it? How do I control it? Where's my next pass? Where's my next move? Yes, not just running between yeah. cones and passing the ball. So would it be fair, you know, a, a advice from you and me that? Um, uh, well, of course, grassroots, but, but at least especially because the boys are in nearly every day now. Um, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's changed. So that um, one piece of advice we can give is be serious about your session planning. Be uh, Tick off your, when you go in your drill library, look for, for example, tick off, um, is this fun? Is it competitive? Is there less waiting time? Is there a lot of decision making? Yep. So kind, kind of have a, a checklist, drill. you know, and then, Tick yep. it off. Well, preparation is yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. You should be doing that every day anyway. Yeah. And really, if you're really thinking about your team and the way you want your team to play and mm. you know what you're looking for, mm. you should be maybe devising a few things in your head and trying to work out how can I set something up mm. which will give me uh, what I'm looking for here. Mm. Don't, don't be looking for some magic uh, formula or, or, or go into a book which is going to say to me here it is mm. you need to you need to be really thinking well what is it I'm looking for and in this situation what sort of scenarios can I envisage mm. and how can I prepare and mm. set that up mm. because really and truly it's a, it's a constant process isn't it uh, as a young coach I think you're always looking for someone who's you know had a good record and has coach maybe a long time to answer your questions uh, with a simple answer mm. you know like I'll take a, take a simple example one I remember <laughs> a question I remember putting to Don Howe in the in the mid 70s or maybe after a year or two when yeah. I'd been working at Harmstead grappling with all these things every day what am I going to do today yeah. Yeah. what session am I going to put on what what practices what should I do and I thought, well, Don will know that. You know, Don was a fantastic yeah. coach and one of my idols, and I'd yeah. been lucky enough to get to know him. Yeah. And I was at the training ground at the Arsenal. Cause I used to go there when I came home at Christmas. Mm. And I said to him, how do you prepare your sessions? Don, you know, how do you, how do you work out what you want to work on in, in a week? You know, for example, in a week, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you prepare the week's training? Mm. He said, well, he said, um, it's all based on what we do. And he said, he said for example... We're not we're not defending very well. We're scoring goals. We're mm. doing okay. We're 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 scoring okay, but we keep letting them in. You know. We're not, so I decide we need to do some work on defending. He said, but then he said a couple of weeks go by and he stopped scoring. <laughs> so I decide I better do some yeah. work on attacking. Yeah. And I didn't want to hear that. I thought no, I don't want to hear that. I want you to tell me Mondays is defending. Tuesdays is attacking. Yes, yes. That's what I wanted to hear. Yes. And here's the practices. Yes. Don't tell me that. And yet now I realise he told me the only thing an intelligent, decent, honest person could tell you as a coach. Mm. 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 Oh, yeah, well, I had also the privilege, and he was a friend of mine and, and, and taught me a lot. And, um, um, 
So uh, finally, Roy, um, three tips to youth coaches. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, you shouldn't really spring pe- questions like that no. because they're, like, uh, they're <laughs> quite philosophical and and, and uh, complicated okay. questions. Well, I'll think about it. You could, yeah. I'll, I'll need to think about it. Three, okay. three pieces of advice to youth coaches. To youth coaches who are working, say. B- to, with players between 12 and 16. Let's narrow it down because yeah. because un, I think under 12 is a different, uh, excuse the pun, ball game. Yeah. Well, I think it would have to be probably nuanced in, you know, are these the 12 to 16-year-olds who've been selected by by clubs and, mm. and, and already in academies because mm. these coaches really will be, you know, probably A-licensed a coaches, maybe yeah. even pro-licensed mm. coaches. And then you've got the, the grassroots ones. The advice to the grassroots ones is very simple. You know, make certain that every kid who's at your training session finds some enjoyment from it and doesn't want to give the game of football up because of what you've done as a coach. You know, I remember saying to them, they asked me to look into that when I was at Melman. I remember upbraiding a coach because um, I heard that a kid had you know, left the field crying. Mm. And I said to him, my wife would do a better job than you. Because a I could tell her a couple of practices to put mm. on, she'd stand back and the kids would get on with it, and no one would leave the field crying. So I, that would definitely be a piece of advice. Yes, but I think as you move a little bit further up than that, a bit more complicated, then the advice is to accept the job that you're doing as the job at the moment, and not see it as a platform mm. for a so-called bigger job further forward. Mm. It might lead to that. But don't start trying to coach the 12, 13 and 14 year olds mm. as if you're preparing for a Manchester United Champions League game in a week's time. Mm. That would be one piece of advice. Mm. For me, it's always preparation. Make certain that you've really thought out what your session is and, and be prepared to analyse it. Mm. Be prepared after to say, well, this is what I prepared to do. This is what I wanted to see from the session. Mm. Did I get it? And if not, why not? What do I need to do mm. next time? And then the third thing, I suppose, is is to develop um, what all coaches need, whether they're working with 12 to 14-year-olds, a degree of resilience. Mm. Because these coaches will go into games, you know, with their under-13, under-14 teams, as anxious to win, mm. as Pep Guardiola and, and Jurgen Klopp are to win in their match in the Premier League on Saturday. Mm. And they're going to be happy when they win, and they're going to be a bit disappointed when they lose. Uh, you have to be careful there because, you know, you're dealing with, with quite vulnerable individuals yeah. and you need to make certain that in the euphoria of the win, you're not doing things which are going to negatively affect the children and even more so letting the defeats affect you in a way which is going to perhaps affect the children even more detrimentally. Mm. So I think they're, they're important things. But I suppose globally... Anyone going into coaching needs, and you alluded to it earlier, you need a love of the game. You need a passion for it. You've got to want to do it. You've got to believe that I'm in coaching because I like to be with a group of players. I like to test myself out with the practices I'm doing. I like to try and put those practices on and help them become a better player, a better team. This is something which is my life. I want to do it. If you don't want to do that, if it doesn't give you that much enjoyment, if it's just something to do on a Tuesday or Thursday evening, move away from it because the, the coaching can give you great satisfaction. Mm. But it can also bring about a lot of heartache and a lot of disappointments. And you need to know that if I'm going to do this seriously, I'm ready for the heartaches, I'm ready for the disappointment, but I'm also going to really look forward to the great moments the coaching sessions can give me. So, Roy, you and I have spent two lifetimes, uh, <laughs> and um, I know you appreciate it. I, you know, we've talked about that. It's we we did something we loved. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a lot of people um, don't say that. I wish they could. Um, the only way they're going to do it is to try. So Good. it's been it's you know always a privilege to speak to you, my friend. My pleasure, Alf. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, Roy, great pleasure. Thanks for sharing your insights yeah, and experience. Not at all. Not at all. Fantastic. Thank you.